Well, thank you for joining me today for the Spiritual Leadership Podcast, and I'm super excited about today's topic. We're going to be talking about mentoring, and uh, oftentimes I'm asked, what is involved with mentoring? What's your philosophy of mentoring? And so I'm going to share several steps with you today on how to have a great mentoring relationship. Before we get into the lesson today, I want to mention something that I'm really excited about as well, and that is the California for Christ initiative. California for Christ is a church planting initiative, and we're excited about the number of California pastors that are signing on board to say, I want to help church planters. I want to help support them financially. I want to help uh, be a friend to them as they get the church started. And we're looking to invite uh, young men, not only from West Coast Baptist College, but from any Bible-believing college, from uh, churches across the country. I think of cities like Knoxville, Tennessee, with 300,000 people and 300 Baptist churches. And then I think of a city like uh, San Bernardino with 300,000 people and one independent Baptist church. And some cities of over 75,000 with no Baptist church here in the state. And Dr. Lee Robertson taught me to punch holes in the darkness, to, to really endeavor to make a difference for Christ. And I want you to know that uh, church planting is God's plan for making a difference. And uh, we believe from Acts 13 that, that uh, churches uh, send the church planters, but we wanted to establish uh, something of a fellowship of men in the West who would encourage those who come out this way. And so the California for Christ initiative is our endeavor to reach the 40 million people of California. And we believe many times as California goes, so goes the nation. So people can curse the left coast or you can help us make a difference. And uh, you can uh, visit us at our website. We'd be happy to see you visit at uh, ca4christ.org and uh, pray for us as we're doing our best to plant new churches out here in the West. Well, if you have a piece of paper or a pen, uh, you may want to take a few minutes uh, to jot down some notes with us or to download the notes. And I want to read from 2 Timothy chapter 2 as we begin this discussion today on the subject of church planting, oh brother, on the subject of mentoring. And uh, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. You know, we use a lot of buzzwords today, and, and certainly mentoring is one of those. But uh, when you think about it, the whole process of mentoring is really a biblical process, something that was outlined by Jesus and the disciples, and something that was modeled by Paul with Timothy and Titus and many, many others. And uh, as we think about modern day mentoring, I think it's good to go back to those biblical models and, and to remember Jesus' ministry, for example. I remember years ago reading a book entitled, Disciples Are Made, Not Born. Uh, and the book was published by the Navigators. And, and it talked about the fact that salvation is the miracle of a moment, but discipleship is the process of a lifetime. And what really struck me was that Jesus, in focusing on the 12, literally trained these men who would turn the world upside down for Christ. And yet it was through that three and a half years of what we would call mentoring that their lives were radically prepared uh, to do the radical work that God had called them to do. And so we learn from Jesus as he called the 12. We see here in the Apostle Paul's ministry that he challenges Timothy to, to take the things that he had heard of him and to commit those to faithful men to the point that they could train others also. In Philippians 4, 9, Paul said, the things that thou hast both received and heard and seen in me. So mentoring is a process that involves more than hearing. It involves a reception and it involves an observation. And uh, this is something that uh, we understand is vital in mentoring, is, is the holistic approach to training. It's not just the instruction. Um, it's not just passing the test, but it's also experiencing the ministry. So I want to share with you today uh, seven principles that God has blessed in my life as I have endeavored to mentor our staff, uh, some much more closely. The pastoral staff right now is comprised of 12 men, 
Uh, we have around 30 men that are out in the pastorate across the country that God uh, privileged me to have some uh, mentoring relationship at some point in their life as well. And, uh, and I, I just thank God for the privilege of, of training others also. And so today, I'll start with this first thought, and that is we must establish the relationship and the parameters of the relationship up front. So when it comes to this matter of uh, having a mentoring relationship, uh, it's something that if it's truly going to be that kind of a relationship, it needs to be understood as such. Now, I believe that's uh, truly understood between maybe a pastor and his inner staff, um, but it's something that can be discussed even in the interview process. Uh, what is it like to be trained here? Do you mentor the staff? Uh, what would be expected of me? Sometimes, as you mentor someone, you may ask them, what are you expecting in this relationship? Um, and I think one of the reasons that having this conversation about establishing the perimeters, the parameters of the, of the relationship, one of the reasons it's so important is so that there's not unmet expectation on either side. And so to talk about uh, what kind of time are we putting into this, um, if it's a long distance mentoring relationship, probably gonna be more of a phone call, email, periodic checkup, and, and it's, it's a little different in that respect. So I think it's good to establish uh, what the parameters are so that we know what's expected in the mentoring relationship. Ask the person that you're seeking mentorship from uh, you know, specifics about the time commitment that they can make or what predetermined checkpoints will you have along the way. Um, and you should ask the person you're mentoring, what are you looking for in this relationship? Uh, are there some areas specifically? Are we talking about uh, perhaps managerial? Are we talking about spiritual? Are we talking about family? Are we talking about all of the above? So it's important that, that you both know that you're in that relationship, that you know the predetermined checkpoints, and finally, that you know the goals or the purpose of the relationship. And it's fine along the way of the relationship to ramp up or ramp down those expectations, but it's excellent to establish the parameters up front. So when you're in a mentoring relationship, uh, agree with the person up front about uh, the scope and sequence of that relationship. And secondly, I would say that uh, as we look into some methods, uh, I would say that the first uh, mentoring concept uh, that I find myself using on a daily basis is what I would simply uh, call the one-minute lessons, the one-minute lessons. Now, these are similar to Ken Blanchard's book, The One-Minute Manager. These are going to be those mentoring sessions that typically involve uh, either a one-minute praise, a one-minute uh, reprimand sometimes, and a one-minute goal setting. Uh, these are those moments where you pull uh, the guy aside that you're training and working with, and, and you might say something like, man, uh, the, uh, the organization of that clinic was outstanding, just outstanding. Uh, and then you might say, not having ushers, though, for that last session, uh, something went wrong there, and uh, you're bringing that to their attention. Uh, let's, put that on our, uh, let's put that on our planner sheet for the next event. You're giving them a goal. A lot of mentoring is just like that. It's, it's a moment where you're praising, it's a moment where you're reminding of something that didn't go well, maybe even reprimanding, and then giving a goal for the next time. So once I've established the relationship, then I feel I have the liberty to not have to always sit down, have coffee, and go through a lengthy conversation. We'll talk about those in a moment, but one of the methods for mentoring is going to be just the ongoing relationship of of uh, bringing their attention to areas that are working well or areas that could have been accomplished differently or better for the Lord. So we have the one minute ongoing, one minute uh, mentoring sessions. And uh, if there's a chemistry developing between these two individuals, those one minute lessons can be powerful and helpful. Uh, then moving along into the methodology of mentorship, uh, I would say that there must also be those planned conversations. You have the one-minute lessons, but there must be planned conversations. 
Now the planned conversations are going to be literal appointments. Uh, this is gonna be for some people weekly. You're gonna have a weekly mentoring session. It may be somebody outside of your church or organization and you're just gonna sit down with them. I've mentored a lot of businessmen, uh, military leaders, different uh, uh, folks in our community, politicians uh, that we meet with and, and we'll just sit down and say, okay, uh, where are you at right now in career, in life, in family? It's planned. It may be something that's planned weekly, monthly, or quarterly. But the purpose of this meeting uh, is to help them to take steps forward in a Christ-honoring way uh, in their uh, area of career or family or ministry, depending on what you've agreed upon the purpose for the mentoring. And so these are really probably the backbone of a mentoring relationship. And I will tell you that uh, we must be disciplined to keep those appointments. Uh, in today's society, we can use some Zoom for that uh, in today's culture, but I personally would say that really good mentoring is gonna be face-to-face, person-to-person, where you're sensing whether they're receiving, where you're seeing the facial expression, and that's an appointment that you make and that you keep and cherish and you let them know uh, that it's vital to you. Then, uh, I, I would say moving along with the methodology, as I'm working with someone, there's going to be one-minute manager style, one-minute uh, meetings, there's going to be planned conversations in the schedule. But thirdly, there's going to be a lot of staff training. And someone might say, well, that doesn't sound like mentoring, it doesn't sound real personal. But I believe that a systematic training of the staff, especially if the person you're mentoring is in your team and in, on, on that environment, uh, that this is a great mentoring time. Uh, yes, it's a group time, but this is a time where you're able to uh, impact several lives at once, and the mentoring process is taking place as interaction is happening and people are sensing conviction or lessons being taught uh, across the room. Uh, it gives you also a time to maybe cover some things that someone wouldn't take so personally, like that was just at me or something, uh, you're able to approach it at a group setting in an effort to help many people uh, accomplish their goals uh, because everybody wants to uh, fulfill the purpose that God has given to them. Uh, staff training times should, in my opinion, uh, include a thought out lesson. There should be uh, normally uh, a time given there for uh, if possible, some questions or some feedback. I like to always say, hey, I'm here at the front if you have a question after I teach the staff. So even though it's a group teaching structure, uh, it can lend itself to uh, a personal time afterwards. And it's not uncommon for me to spend a good 30 minutes after a staff meeting clarifying, um, helping someone to implement. And so I believe that staff training is staff mentoring. Um, and, and many times, uh, staff meetings are relegated to a to-do list environment. And, and there is some of that. Uh, there are meetings that are more about updates on the project specifically. But what I'm talking about right now is that you as a leader or as a mentor should plan two, three, four meetings a month with your team where you're literally mentoring them on topics of time management, on topics of fiscal responsibility, living with integrity. Um, last week I taught a lesson on characteristics of a winning team uh, and uh, how we show discretion, how we encourage one another, and so forth. So uh, these are truly mentoring styled lessons. So I want to sit down with someone and talk about what does mentoring mean to you? What are your expectations? I wanna kinda lay that out so that we're not setting it up for disappointment. And then we begin, and we might begin with a talk in a hallway or walk into the car or uh, you know, making those personal brief observations. From there, I'm gonna move into, hey, let's meet next Thursday at two or let's go get coffee Wednesday at one, whatever. And we're gonna work on those types of meetings. And of course, those are often appreciated and helpful. Thirdly, I'm gonna make sure that my staff content, my leadership content is prepared uh, and it is applicable in the mentoring sense across the board in that meeting. Uh, next, I find another good principle or methodology for mentoring is when we read a book together as a staff. 
Uh, we'll take a book, sometimes we'll take a secular book, maybe Good to Great, or maybe some, some uh, type of book that deals with something like The Advantage by Leon Coney, or uh, maybe we'll go into a book on prayer by E.M. Bounds, or something of this nature. But uh, reading a book, and then uh, having two or three meetings where you're discussing uh, the book, uh, chapter by chapter, what did God teach you in the reading of that book, or what do you feel we could apply, uh, was there a, a weakness that was helped with this reading? Uh, is, is there an area that you feel we can improve upon, uh, even organizationally? And so uh, another mentoring tool is the sharing of material, whether it's a book or an article, uh, maybe watching a podcast, something that allows you to enter into a deeper discussion. And uh, this is certainly a great mentoring tool, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or, again, with a team that you're mentoring. And uh, I have a, a list of books on our website, paulchapel.com, that, that are categorized by different subjects, but many of those have been reads by our staff team over the years. And so I really do recommend group reading and discussion as a great uh, mentoring tool, but it doesn't have to be group. It can be one-on-one -on -one as well with the person um, that you're mentoring. And so uh, reading and, and discussing is definitely a great method. Now I'm gonna share one with you now that at first you might say, that doesn't sound like mentoring, but just bear with me. The next method that I find to be helpful is when there is a report list that is given. If there's someone that I'm working with and they have some assignments and they're working on assignments from me or from someone else, I'll ask them to give me uh, a weekly or a bi-weekly update of what they're working on, what is the status, um, how do they need help in that area. Now, I'm a believer in this, and I'll tell you why. Number one, it forces the person that is being mentored to literally think through and articulate uh, what they're doing, what they're learning, and what they need. Um, it, it, it creates something more concise than a rambling conversation. Now, I know that many people like to have lots and lots of conversations, and I enjoy that myself. But there's times when, if I can get enough information ahead of the conversation, I can really pinpoint my help in the mentoring session. So I've often asked men that have been in a mentoring relationship with me, if they would give me this list and just say, I'm, I'm working on this ministry concept, I'm working on discipling these people, I'm working on you know this other project, and then to comment to me, I'm discipling this family, uh, I just found out that it's a blended family and the father's not really uh, giving the same time to the kids from the previous marriage and you know, writing that out a bit. What does that do for me? It allows me as, as a mentor to think through and scripturally develop answers so that whether it's an email answer or a sit down answer, I can take that. It also helps the person being mentored to uh, think through what they're involved in and to e explain in uh, concise terms what their question might be. And so I think a reporting list with comments and questions is a mentoring tool, and it helps the one that is mentoring to prepare uh, themselves with a quality answer, and it helps the one that's being mentored to clearly think through uh, the process that they're involved in. Because sometimes as they're writing that out, they realize either I already know the answer to that, or I, I'm, I'm not even to be involved with this, uh, or I, this is definitely my area, but I need specific help here. And so it's a great tool uh, just making the report list. Now, I have had some men over the years say, well, I don't wanna just make lists, I wanna talk about it. And, uh, and my answer always is, we're gonna talk about it, but give me the list so that I can study and understand what you're dealing with. And, uh, and it's, it's truly been helpful over the years. All right, the next mentoring tool or method that I wanna share with you is a mentoring retreat. And a lot of pastors that I know do this, whether it's five or 10 men from their church, their Sunday school class, uh, whether it's four or five young pastors, I've heard of guys taking hikes to Montana, doing all these things. Um, and those really are great times. And the advantage of a retreat, obviously, is 
you're away from the normal routine. Uh, you're really able to get to know someone's temperament. Uh, you're able to understand some personal testimonies. You know, I've often said if you want to know really someone's temperament, uh, just play basketball for 30 minutes. You'll find out uh, if they're a hothead, you'll find out if they're hyper competitive, you'll find out if they're glad to pass or if they always need to shoot. You get to know a lot about people in those environments. Uh, so sometimes in a retreat environment, uh, you know, people will open up a little more, whether it's doing something athletically or whether it's just during a time of sharing, getting away from the normal routine. So you're not seeing everybody in their work outfit, you're not seeing everybody in their uh, title you know, as this, this associate pastor this or accountant or whatever. It's just guys that are out trying to seek God, trying to improve the way that they live for God. And so I have planned over the years a couple of retreats every year uh, for what I call emerging leaders in the church. And sometimes we'll take them to a hotel, we'll uh, have a conference room there where we teach for a couple of hours, where we share prayer requests, we have Q&A, I talk about how to have family altar, how to, how to work on your family finances, what does it mean to be a faithful man of God. And uh, these become building block times of really establishing relationship, uh, and especially in a larger work, uh, sometimes whether it's again a, a company or a church, it, it really gives people the heart of the leader in those times, because otherwise you may just be the guy that's you know kind of up on the uh, platform preaching, but this allows you to have uh, more personal time with people. And so I'm a big believer in leadership retreats or mentoring retreats. And we do that with college leadership, church leadership. We do that with the deacons. We do that with the staff every year, offsite retreats. And then I do that once or twice a year with emerging leaders right within the church. And these are guys that, you know, they've been saved five or 10 years. They're growing. Maybe these are future deacons of the church. Maybe these are future adult Bible class teachers but they need that mentoring that comes in the way of a retreat. So we sit down with an individual, we establish the parameters of the relationship so that there's no unmet expectation. We recognize that we want to mentor them to the point that they can teach others also. So scripturally, that's very foundational from a doctrinal uh, standpoint. And we then we begin the journey. And the journey might begin with a one minute session here and there. Uh, a praise, a reprimand, a goal setting. Uh, then it might move in from there to the planned meetings where we're having a planned conversation weekly or bi-weekly. And then we incorporate the staff training as a mentoring time as well. And then from there, we're going to do some reading where we share back and forth what we've learned and you know what is it that uh, maybe we can improve upon. And then from the staff time of reading or from the reading with the individual, we're going to begin reporting as well, some report list. And you might have the personal training meeting one week and the report list the next week. And then uh, we're going to have maybe a bi uh, uh, or a quarterly rather uh, re uh, time of a retreat or twice a year retreat where we take maybe the three or four guys we're mentoring and we just really spend time as Jesus did with Peter, James, and John, for example, and just kind of cultivating uh, an understanding of life, ministry, family in that context. And then finally, I want to say this about mentoring. If you follow the process that we've just outlined, and as we've gone through these, uh, these seven steps, uh, really identifying as the first step, and then these six methods that we've given, what will begin to happen in your ministry is that you'll begin to develop a culture of mentoring. And, and I don't want to limit the importance of a culture where a new person comes in and they're actually being mentored by the surroundings. They're being mentored by the way the print work is done. They're being mentored by the way the organization of the office is kept. They're being mentored by the passion for souls. They're being mentored by the passion for quality. And uh, as I was speaking to our staff recently about you know, cultivating a team that is uh, helpful and uh, admonishing and a team that is compassionate. And as we went through some of these core values, I shared with our team, I said, well, you know, we're adding staff right now. We're adding team members on the church side, the school side, the college side, the publication side. And as we live these values, we literally are engaging and mentoring people 
even sometimes non-verbally. So I believe that a church that has a healthy organization, uh, healthy team leaders, uh, they are really set up to bring people along because it's sometimes better felt than telt. So we can talk all day long about ordering our private world. We can talk all day long about, uh, you know, organizing our lists, such as uh, David Allen's book on, on developing lists and such. But then to be a part of an organization that's using it, uh, it's truly uh, better caught than taught. And it's something that people truly desire, is to be a part of a mentoring climate like that. And so I want to encourage you to intentionally mentor, or you might say, I need to intentionally be mentored. Maybe you're a young pastor, maybe you're a new missionary, maybe you're just starting off in some form of education, and, and you want to glean. And I know, as we mentioned at the very beginning with California for Christ, one of the things we want to do besides funding church plants is we're going to be creating a partnership relationship for the church planter so that they have a friend nearby them who they can talk to, have coffee with. They've got a, a couple of pastors that maybe are a little older who can help with building permit issues or family issues. Uh, and and we're, we're intrinsically involving a mentoring philosophy into the church planting initiative because we know that mentoring is super important for the church planter. And so I want to encourage you today, based on 2 Timothy 2.2, to say, Lord, help me to commit truth. Help me to train someone so well that they can train others also. And I know that in my life, I've been privileged to mentor many, many people who are now mentoring many, many other people. And that's, that's what it's all about. There's a great reward in investing in the lives of others. And uh, I hope that some of these methods today that I've shared, maybe put a little thought in your mind of how you could spend a little more time or a little more quality time investing in someone as a mentor. And uh, it's a privilege to do that. We're very excited about what God is doing here on the campus of Lancaster Baptist Church. We have our youth conference coming up in March. Uh, visit our website if you have a youth group. We'd love to welcome your teens. We're coming back after two years of a hiatus because of COVID. We're excited, not just about Magic Mountain. We're excited about preaching. We have some great preachers, Brother Dean Miller, Brother Dave Delaney, Brother Jim Shetler. These are good men coming in to preach for the teens. And uh, I thank you for being a part of the Spiritual Leadership Podcast today. May God bless you as you mentor and influence others for the cause of Christ.